From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. The Democratic primary in the 2022 race for Rhode Island governor has gotten crowded. That's in stark contrast to the Republican side of the ballot, where so far no candidate has formally launched a campaign. Technically, candidates have until next June to get in the race, but in reality, campaigns and fundraising are often up and running a year out. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi. Uh, joining us in studio to talk about that and a whole lot more is Chair of the State Republican Party, Susie Yankee. Chair, it's good to see you. Welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me. I want to start with the governor's race. In September, you told our colleague Kim Kalinian that the GOP would announce, quote, a very formidable electable candidate by the end of October. Just check the calendar this morning. It <laughs> happens to be November 11th. What happened? So, um, you know, the state party and myself in particular don't control when a campaign decides that they're going to announce. Yeah, but there must have been some reason you said that to Kim. Yeah, well, I um, was under the impression that uh, a formidable candidate would formally announce before then. Um, in talking behind the scenes, there are lots of things that go on, getting your consultants, your vendors, everything in place, and making a conscious effort of exactly when you're going to launch a campaign. So I can give advice and consent to candidates and campaigns, but it's really up to the campaign as to when they're going to announce. But we will have a candidate. Uh, we will. Will, that's completely up to the um, candidate. Now you are not saying now a I am not. I am not going to say, you know, I'm uh, not going to say. Still I, mean, I still feel very I, I'll hopeful. Just, I'll just, the elephant room, we, we assume you're talking about Blake Filippi, the, the House, House Minority, Minority Leader. Leader. Maybe. Uh, yeah, exactly. And you haven't been shy about saying how good a candidate you think he would be. Blake still, or I should say Leader Filippi, uh, he still sounds a little hesitant. He was just on with Kim actually this week and, and you know, about what a big undertaking it is, et cetera. Sure, it's a lot to think about, but um, you know, I also, my phone has been ringing off the hook. Um, last week, you know, the Republicans had great success across the country, not just in Virginia. In Virginia, we know we took the governor's race, we took the lieutenant governor, we took the attorney general's race. And it was not the typical face of the Republican Party. Um, they were young, they were a diverse group of people. My phone has been ringing off the hook since last week with people that are very interested in running. So I have spent a lot of time with a variety of interested, people. Just Clarify, interested in running for governor or multiples? Uh, interested not only in running for governor, but governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, legislative offices. They were energized um, across the state that they looked at someone that took out the uh, speaker in New Jersey, Sweeney, someone that spent a minimal amount of money, but hard work and was frustrated at is what is happening in the country with the economy, with immigration, with the uh, continual a state of emergency that we have here in Rhode Island, people are frustrated and they, they see that anybody can win. There is no safe seat anywhere across the country anymore. And if you want people to vote for you, you have to go earn it. But what did, what did you take away? Because you know, you have to run campaigns as a Republican differently in blue leaning states than red right. states. Of course, uh, we see Charlie Baker obviously does that across the border in Massachusetts. What lesson did you take away from the wins both in Virginia as well as how close the Republican nominee came in New Jersey for what you and the Republicans need to do? Because it's now been 15 years since the Republicans have won a statewide race in Rhode Island. So something different obviously probably needs to happen. Right. Well, I think that you have to put up credible candidates. I think in the past, you know, people have just run and, and have not looked strategically at where you can win. We have looked at the data of where we could possibly make inroads. I mean, there are districts that are so solidly Democratic. When you have a plus 89 Democratic district, is a Republican actually going to make inroads there? Probably not. So we tell our candidates there, but we are really looking for candidates that are well versed in in and, and listen to their constituents, listen to the residents and voters, what is important to them in their district, and to go talk to them and, and win their votes and win on issues. What is important to those people? In Virginia, we know that uh, the parents came out in force and people that typically don't vote for Republicans were tired and frustrated and we're told parents don't matter in education. You have no right to have any say. That has energized people across the state. In particular, you look at uh, a town like North Kingstown. There are people angry at what's going on there. And out of that, candidates are coming forward and want to run for office. So, and we're really interested in school committee, 
town council, and certainly the state legislative office. So you're not just focused on winning the governor's office no, next year? No, no. We're not just focused. That's certainly a wonderful office. I'm very excited about our candidate for AG, who has announced, Chaz Kalenda. Um, he's a formidable candidate. That's an important office. The AG should be really apolitical. You are there to enforce the law. Um, you know, I think our current AG has gotten a little too political. Um, do your job. Do your How job so? and do it effectively. Well, he weighs into issues that he doesn't have to. And certainly when they made like election. What? Well, the election law changes last year. Why didn't he jump in and defend the state law? If the um, secretary of state and everybody went through the process and changed those election law changes in, in terms of the mail ballots and uh, removed the security provisions of the two witnesses and the notary. If they had gone through the General Assembly, which is what they should have done, that's where the law is made, but they didn't. They entered into a consent degree. We took that all the way to the Supreme Court and were knocked down because we weren't hurt on the merits. We were knocked down because they said we had no standing. The person that had standing was our attorney general, and he did not get into um, the case. Now, he should have. That's his job. Whether he agreed with it or not, that was his job, and he, re and he removed himself. And he starts to, to get very political. Um, we just want them to defend the law. I, I do want to pivot back to the governor's race just briefly. Our yes. viewers might, uh, some of them might be wondering, is, is Alan Fung, former mayor of Cranston, is he going to take a third shot at it? What do you say? Um, uh, I have not talked to Alan about that. He has not indicated uh, thus far that he's interested. I have heard through the grapevine, and again, not talked to Alan, and he has not said this to me, that he may be interested in running for state treasurer. Okay. So that may be a race that he's interested in. But of course, Alan is now out working in the private sector and Sometimes it's hard when you, you <laughs> yes. step over that line. <laughs> of to course. Get back. Uh, and briefly, there's one candidate who has um, indicated that he, he might run. Former Turnpike and Bridge Authority Chairman Dave Darlington said he's exploring a run as a Republican candidate. Has, what has he told you? Has he told you he's definitely going to do it? So we sat down um, and had coffee together, Dave and I. Um, he's a very uh, intelligent uh, a successful businessman. Um, he has government experience. He worked in the Lincoln administration. He worked in the Kachiri administration. So he would be a formidable candidate. He has not, as of yet, filed any uh, formal paperwork, but he has talked about uh, running for governor. And of course, I said to him that that's fine. As a Republican, we would support you any way we could. Um, what I foresaw at that point is that there would probably be a primary. Um, it doesn't mean, you know, we've seen uh, Lincoln Amen and certainly Don Kachiri did not win the endorsement of the state Republican Party and right. they went on to win the primary. So I said, but again, there are six people that are currently uh, running on the Democratic side. So there'll be a lot of attention on a Democratic primary. Um, and a lot of people, because we have an open primary, would be jumping there. So you're talking about the base in the Republican Party. Will they be? Uh, you've said before one of your most important jobs is chairs to raise money. And I pulled the Republican State Committee's financials this morning, mm -hmm. and the party only has $27,000 on hand. It's reported mm -hmm. to the Board of Elections currently. And that's less than, less than half what you had at this point in the last gubernatorial right. cycle. Why is fundraising slowed down compared to then? Well, I think we, you know, during COVID, it was very difficult. We had to cancel all of our fundraisers last year. Um, but, you know, that's a, a job that I'm continuing to do. We're continuing to reach out to people. We're continuing to, to reach out to the business community and say, this is not a good environment for you. Do you want to stay here? We're going to put up a good candidate. I think as our candidates start to announce, the fundraising should pick up. Uh, Target 12 has done a lot of reporting on a multi-million dollar state contract that went to a startup education consulting firm called ILO Group. Emails we obtained show a close confidant to the governor. Uh, to Governor Dan McKee wrote the initial blueprint for the contract that ultimately went to one of his subordinates. Do you think this is going to be a campaign issue next year? I think it's absolutely going to be a campaign issue. We call it the McKee-McGee uh, contract, you know, it, isn't it nice you develop an RFP and then you go bid on it? I think it's a disaster for uh, 
Dan McKee. We call him Weak McKee. He's definitely weak on this issue. Um, it's, you know, we try to give a little leeway to governors that if you're new, give them a little leeway into how the process works. But he's been in government for a long time. He was the mayor of Cumberland. He has, was lieutenant governor for six years. Um, he knows how the process works. This was a disaster. I mean, you had two people uh, bid on this. One that built, bid less than a million dollars and the other bid over eight million dollars. Well, they was a disconnect as to what the scope and sequence of this this contract was and then you award it to somebody who uh, just uh, put together their corporation what a day before they got on the state vendor list how did they get approved so fast so there are a lot of different issues with that and I think it's gonna hurt Dan McKay it's gonna show that he's weak um, in that area that he doesn't know what he's doing and it it makes you go there's a definite appearance of impropriety the governor has said, just to, to push back a little, that, look, he was it, it was an emergency. He needed COVID assistance. And these are people he trusted would do a good job. And, you know, you could see voters saying, well, we did want to get the schools back open. Yeah, but the schools are back open, right? And, and where's that contract now? Where does it sit? Did they provide any value benefit to get the schools open? You know, you're looking at a vaccination rate here in Rhode Island that's well over 91 percent. Um, no one can say with a straight face that we're not at herd immunity that why are we still in a state of emergency now what is going on after 20 months is it to avoid talking about other issues because then you can blame everything on we're still in a state of emergency so there are lots of things that dan mckee is going to have to answer for i think he's going to have a hard time in a primary next year donald trump energizes the democrats would it be better for rhode island republican candidates for uh the former president to remain relatively quiet in 2022 well, I think he's been banned from Twitter, so I think he'll that be... That could change. Yeah, you know, that could change. But I think that um, certainly he's not the president anymore. I mean, I think the Democrats would still like to keep talking about Donald Trump, but he's not the president. We've got a president, and it's President Joe Biden. And I get that, but my question was, would it be better for your candidates not to have Donald Trump front and center? Well, I, I think that, you know, we don't control his schedule. I don't think that Rhode Island, in, in terms of the national politics... <laughs> you just do not want to say yes or no on that one, huh? No, I just don't even think that he's going he's gonna to even come to Rhode Island. I mean, I don't think he's going to play into it. I mean, I think people have to look at what's happened here. It's 86 years of complete Democratic control here. Let's focus in on what's going on here. And if you want to talk about national politics, he's not the president anymore. I, I think he's have, not the president. I, I, fair. I do have, uh, I have to ask you one other Trump-related question, which is he's still claiming he didn't lose the election last year, even though Republicans did so well otherwise last year in the election. And it, it seems like a lot of Republicans still believe that. What do you hear at the grassroots among Rhode Island Republicans? Is there a widespread belief that the, that only the presidential results were, were, were tampered with? Which, again, there's no evidence for that. You know, I think that there's a lot of misconception about what went on um, across, across the country. You know, I focus in on what happened here. Um, are there irregularities that happen in elections? Yes. Was there enough irregularities to cause a change in the election? I don't believe so, because I was on the ground. I think if more people get involved in the process, you know, there were 460 different precincts in Rhode Island. We had 60 poll watchers. If people really want to see what's going on, show up and pay attention. Um, we know that the voter rolls here are not clean. Uh, it's a process that's involved. I think the things that we do well in Rhode Island is we belong to the ERIC consortium. There are 30 different states. So if somebody registers in a different state, you get removed from the voter list here. There are federal regulations that you can't be removed for two presidential cycles. That's eight years. You can become inactive, but any time in that period, you can then become a voter. So I think here, uh, people were upset. Things are different. But you got to get out and vote. Um, one thing I disagree with is Republicans say, well, I don't believe in the election, so I'm not going to show up. Well, then you automatically are giving it to the, your opponent then. Show up. Get involved in the process. Pay attention. If it's that important to you, make sure that you know who's running for secretary of state, who's it controlling the elections get involved, run for office. That's my solution to it. Sue Sienke, chair of the state Republican Party, thanks so much for joining us on the program. When we come back, a reporter's roundtable, Eli Sherman. Steph Machado joins us to talk about a controversy in North Kingstown and Providence City Hall. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers.
Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics editor Ted Nisi, and we're joined by our Target 12 colleagues, Steph Machado and Eli Sherman. Hello, welcome to the program. Hi. Eli, we're going to start with you. Uh, you and I and Ted have been doing some reporting, uh, or a lot of reporting, I should say, in, in North Kingstown of a former boys high school basketball coach there, Aaron Thomas. Um, as people may know, he is accused of, uh, by multiple former student athletes of getting them to remove all of their clothes for so-called fat tests. You took the early lead uh, on the reporting for this one, and I, and I know this because we <laughs> work in the same office. Uh, this has been months in the making. I wonder what the evolution of the conversations with the former student athletes, the, the parents, and the town officials that you talked to um, over the last few months where you got, to, got them to where we are right now. Yeah, it's these stories are not easy, as you know, Tim, because um, the, a lot of the people that we talk to obviously don't want to put their name associated with sure. what's going on there. Um, so you, it takes a lot of corroboration. You have to talk to a lot of these people and you have to talk to them one by one and hear their stories and hear how different things overlap. And then you have to go scramble to try and find as much documentation that you can, anything that's been written down over the years that can help uh, show that what they're telling you has credence. And so, like you said, it took a cu couple months, a lot of conversations, a lot of digging, but we got to a point where we felt comfortable that what we were presenting to the public was accurate. I, along with the videographer John Valella, were outside a, a marathon school committee meeting uh, on Saturday, last Saturday in North Kingstown, and we really wanted to talk to Superintendent Phil Auger about what was done in 2018 when the school department was notified about this. This is what happened when we attempted to ask him a question. Take a listen. Mr. OJ, um, can we have a minute here? I don't have a statement right now. We have statements. No, that's okay. We, we sent no, statements wait, to the I think, community. But I think the community would Sorry. like to hear well, from you. Well, we have sent a statement to the community. Yeah, Thank but you. I'd like to ask Why you a couple of questions. Excuse me. What did you Why excuse did me? You 2018. Excuse me. All right, that was Superintendent Phil OJ outside of North Kingstown School Committee meeting. Obviously not answering questions there, Eli, but the, the entire school department is under the microscope. Yeah, big time. So uh, as we first reported uh, last week, you know, the a former student approached the school department in 2018 to raise allegations about this former coach. Um, and after we reported that, the school came out with a two-page statement after that long meeting that you just saw and that you were trying to ask questions about, saying, yeah, they did actually come and the student came and told us, but you know what, he told us that he wasn't naked at the time and so that we had an internal conversation with the coach, told him to change how he was doing these testings and we moved on. It wasn't until this year that more allegations came up and they ended up uh, terminating his contract. But, you know, we went back to that student and he said, listen, the reason that I came forward in 2018 is because I was really uncomfortable and I said that I was naked. So there is this disparity between what we're hearing from the people who have come forward and also the school department, which is been scrambling to sort of get its ducks in the row in terms of communications. And, and as of yet, and as you said, you two have been the lead, our lead reporters on this, but I have not seen any evidence um, that North Kingstown can point to steps taken beyond that one conversation with the coach they acknowledge in 2018, where they sought to figure out, is this a wider problem? Or other did other students have this experience all through 2019 when he won the basketball championship? So he was, he was not only still at the school, he was a prominent a figure. figure in yeah. the school. Yeah. And I'm particularly interested in why North Kingstown police described the case as closed and then the attorney general later said, no, we're still investigating this. And Attorney General Peter Nerona was on the news the other day with Cam Colonian, yeah. going into detail about the what that investigation is entailing now. Well, that actually caught Eli and I a little flat-footed uh, towards the end of our reporting when we, you know, as you say, the North Kingstown Police Department said the case is closed. Um, we couldn't prove what we needed to prove to charge, or we couldn't find the evidence to charge a crime. And then when we reached out to the spokesperson for the AG, they said, no, no, no this review is still up and running. So I do think it's safe to say there was some tension between the local police department and the state AG. Of course, the attorney general's office is um, is continuing, the, is investigating, and we'll, we'll see how that uh, plays out. Steph, trial of the century <laughs> is about to happen at Providence City Hall. <laughs> City clerk Sean Selleck is uh, fighting a termination. You sat down with uh, Selleck last week. I want to play a little sound here to get this conversation going, to talk to him about this. And, and you asked him about uh, the report an outside attorney hired by the council generated leading up to these proceedings and here's what Sean Selleck had to say. You've said this report is politically motivated. Uh, who is leading the political attack against you? 
John Igliozzi. And why would he do that? He wants someone in the city clerk role that plays ball with him. You know, he that's part of the team um, that will draft the legislation in ways that that benefit him, and sometimes concealing things. Sometimes concealing things. That is a that's a shot um, I, at ca Council President mm -hmm. John Igliozzi for sure. For people at home, just give a, a quick summary. What's what's happening here? So Sean is accused by um, three female deputy clerks in his office of um, a series of um, infractions ranging from harassment to bullying. Um, I want to be clear that there isn't any sexual harassment um, or anything of that nature claimed, but they say he's a very aggressive uh, boss to deal with and that he, his management style has caused, um, one of the clerks, Tina Mastriani, says it has caused her stomach aches, nosebleeds. She went on a medical leave um, as a result of, of what's going on in that office. And um, HR had investigated the claims. They did find that the office is toxic, which they said predated Sean's um, appointment as the city clerk, but they said that the allegations did not rise to harassment. Um, the city council then commissioned its own um, investigation by um, an attorney named Carly Iafredi, who found that uh, Sean did, uh, that his, that the allegations did rise to uh, harassment and bullying, and that prompted the city council to move forward with this first ever um, city charter hearing, which I've been describing as sort of the equivalent of an impeachment trial. Mm -hmm. That's not the term that they use, but it's going to happen next week. Um, and there are 19 witnesses who have been subpoenaed, and all, wow. for all accounts, it's going to be quite a spectacle. You know what? Steph is covering the just the facts, X's and O's on this. I wanted to turn to you about the politics as our <laughs> politics editor. Politically speaking, what do you think is going on here? Uh, John Igliozzi is a bare-knuckled fighter in Providence politics and mm -hmm. always has been. He finally attained the council presidency this year because when Sabina Matos was elevated, who had, a, I LG. believe, Steph had put Sean Selleck in place or supported his appointment when yes. she was yep. council president. So Sean Selleck was not his pick. The clerk controls the flow of information and information is currency in politics. And John Igliozzi clearly wants his guy. Now, I don't mean to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not give enough credence to what the other the clerks have said about Sean Selleck. He is, uh, I think, even his supporters acknowledge he can be a, a certain kind of guy. So I'm not saying that, but I just think when HR in the city said there's nothing that rises to this level here, clearly Igliozzi and council leadership decided well, we're going to go another direction. They found their own lawyer who would say there's an issue here. They just want Sean Selleck gone. And Sean's point has been, he, he says, I work for the whole council. I was elected by all 15 members. That's what the charter says. I don't work for John Igliozzi. He shouldn't be able to um, unilaterally place me on leave, which is what happened over the summer. He was put on leave and he fought that and he came back. He says if the full council wants to remove me, the full council has to have a chance to do that and that's exactly what is potentially going to happen in the next week you know step real quick um if people at home they're like city clerk you know why is this mm -hmm. such a big deal they might not understand uh the power the importance that that position holds yeah i mean this is the person who basically controls a lot of the information you know a document isn't official until it's gone through the city clerk's office right he controls uh the city seal he controls the city archives which is sort of all of the documents in the history of the city right um and a lot of the everything that the city council is doing for example they're passing millions of dollars worth of spending those documents are going through the city clerk's office and being posted on a public portal and one of the complaints um, um, that Sean has brought up is that he says occasionally they make changes to the legislation and it should be underlined so you know what the changes are because these are you know dense thick right. documents so that the council members voting on it know exactly what they're voting on and so the public knows exactly what's going on so they can object to it if they want to and he says a lot of that stuff isn't happening and he has as the clerk been trying to uh, raise the alarm about that. And, and just to add to that, because Steph and I both spend a decent amount of time covering legislatures between the council and the General Assembly, you know, for viewers at home, you got to think of as a reporter, you might be in a hearing and all of a sudden you, someone just randomly says, we're going to pass another $3 million or $300 million and or something. Out the and if you don't, right. and if the person who decides how quickly you have that information and whether we can even tweet that it's happening with any information versus maybe it just never gets to the reporters until later, that, that can, right. that can affect and politics. Last year I covered a budget passage in Providence. They actually approved a budget in committee before the document was ever released to the public mm. or to the press because we're part of the public 
public, of course. <laughs> right. Um, so Last I time did, I checked. You know, I, I did get the document the next morning, but they had already approved it at that point. That so is crazy. all of that stuff is going through the clerk's office. All right, Eli, we have one minute left. Left. Uh, we're going to end where we started, back in North Kingstown. You and I have talked to a lot of people who have come forward uh, after our original report aired. What are they saying to you? Yeah, well, you know, for a lot of people, this dates back to the 1990s, right? We've had people who have told us that they were fat tested in the mid-1990s. So it's over three decades that people have been carrying this story with them. And for some of them, to be fair, we've talked to them and it hasn't been uncomfortable for them. But for a lot of them, they have been carrying weight for a long time. And it's been cathartic to some degree to see that finally this discussion is being happen is happening in public. So. Yeah. And it's, it's cutting through the frustration they've had that um, no one has really talked about it to this point or even addressed the matter is what uh, my experience has been as well. So, all right, Eli Sherman, Steph Machado, thanks so much for joining us. If you missed any of the reporting in North Kingstown or on the uh, trial, upcoming trial, I call it a trial of uh, Sean Selleck in Providence, you can catch it on WPRI.com under the Target 12 page. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.